the Mini Transat, an epic 4,000 mile single handed ocean sprint across the wide expanse of the Atlantic Ocean, following the classic trade winds route from France to the Caribbean. The Mini Transat is a unique event for many reasons. The size of the boats and the fact that the ethos of this endurance race is designed to create genuine self-sufficient status for the 80 plus solo sailors who take part in this mammoth biannual event. No outside communications apart from simple VHF radio are allowed. That means no satellite phones, no outside weather information, no laptop computers, no email, no ability to talk to loved ones on the land, nothing. The solo sailor is exactly that, completely isolated from the outside world. In fact, competitors aren't even allowed electronic chart plotters. Instead, the sailor has to navigate with simple paper charts from the floor of the exposed cockpit for days and weeks on end. Even a traditional sextant is part of the mandatory equipment required on board, although in reality, they're rarely used. For these reasons, and when combined with arguably the biggest and most competitive offshore fleet of solo sailors anywhere in the world, you soon realise the Mini Transat is an epic test of physical endurance, navigational skill and competitive ability. In many ways, it's the ultimate yacht race. For me, the Mini is eclipsed only by the Vendée Globe as one of the biggest human tests of endurance, psychological skill and physical competition in which any sailor can undertake. The Mini Transat enjoys a huge following from a wide diverse mix of people across the world, both active sailors and spectators of adventure sport. The event is truly addictive and attracts some of the very best yachtsmen and women from across the globe. Established professional sailors compete alongside serious wannabe pros looking to prove themselves. Together with hardcore adventurists competing for the sheer personal challenge, the Mini Transat has become a logical springboard proving ground for all types of sailor, whatever the motivation. But, and it's a big but, this event is not for the faint-hearted or inexperienced. If I were to offer one word of advice to any future competitor, it would be this. Resilience. Make sure you and the boat have got plenty of it. It's earned its label as being one of the toughest solo ocean races in existence, partly due to its history, but mainly due to the fact that the boats are so small and the challenge so big. The boats are in fact best described as being pint-sized. At just 6.5 metres long, which is not much bigger than the average family estate car, a Mini 6.5 on first appearance, well, it seems woefully small and unlikely a vessel in which to cross a vast ocean. But look closer, and it becomes apparent that these Mini boats are built specifically for a maxi challenge. Watertight bulkheads, internal flotation built into the hull to prevent sinking, either canting keels or water ballast, and a very wide platform to support the huge sail plans. The result is a vessel which is both very fast and in the right hands more than capable of crossing the Atlantic Ocean at high speed. The exact course and route across the Atlantic often changes very slightly every few years due to the French race organisers' commercial partnerships. They can dictate where the start and finish destinations are. But in general, the fleet set out from northwest France around September time to cross the Bay of Biscay heading south towards a first leg stopover in the Canary Islands. There's a second leg which then traverses the Atlantic over to the Caribbean. The 1999 event was a bit different to the norm and went down in history for being one of the very toughest on record. I was one of the 80 competitors who signed up for this edition of the race. I'd spent over a year building up to this challenge and had spent time training in France, undertaking my qualification races and gaining valuable time on the boat 
racing against other like-minded mini sailors. For the 1999 race, the start was staged in the port of Concarneau in northwest France, with the finish line set at Basse-Terre, Guadeloupe in the Caribbean, some 4,000 miles away. The only thing between me and race success was the small task of piloting this superb little boat across the vast expanse of the Atlantic Ocean and, of course, the other 80 competitors, all of whom were intent on their own race-winning strategy. My race proved to be incredibly successful and a springboard to bigger career opportunities. Despite having the oldest boat in the fleet, I finished fifth overall and achieved the then best British result in the history of the race. But that was all in the aftermath of what was to become a serious test of endurance and a fight for survival for the whole fleet during the first days of the race. You see, what you're about to hear is an account of how a simple sailboat race for competition turned into a fight for survival for many due to the severity of the conditions experienced in the Bay of Biscay. After the 99 event, race organisers were forced to change the rules to better protect and prepare future sailors wishing to lay down the gauntlet and take on what is the Mini Transat. The 99 race and the storms in the Bay of Biscay were so severe that the conditions quickly unveiled the avid lack of preparation that many of the sailors were facing. During the first four days of the race, more than half of the fleet had retired. Furthermore, during the height of the storms, many sailors and their boats were just overwhelmed by the sheer magnitude of the conditions. Multiple air and sea rescues were being undertaken to save desperate sailors from their boats. Many friends of mine were in grave and imminent danger. Frankly, we all were. My experience and memories of the storms on the first leg of this race are profound. I don't think the memories will ever fade from my mind. Don't get me wrong, this was a truly awesome and positive experience for me. But for many, this edition of the race proved to be a harsh reminder of the power of the ocean and Mother Nature. Race organisers had briefed the 80 skippers prior to the start, suggesting we would all expect gale force conditions for a time. But very few realised just how serious this vigorous area of low pressure which was already sweeping across the racetrack, would actually become. Inevitably, gale force winds would mature into fully fledged storms. There was a significant degree of chat and debate on the dockside between competitors prior to the start of the race. I think it was at that moment when many sailors started to realise they might be out of their depth given the forecast conditions. It's fair to say that while the 99 race will be remembered as one which frankly could have resulted in serious fatalities, thankfully nobody died, but many sailors' dreams for glory in this event were smashed alongside their boats during the ferocious storm. After this event, the rules for entry into the race materially changed, making an already tough to qualify event even more stringent. Having experienced firsthand what can occur out there on the racetrack when the unexpected takes command, I can certainly understand the race organiser's logic. This is not an event in which the unprepared can succeed. After all, there's no substitute for solid preparation. Now, I had my own fair share of problems to deal with during the worst of the weather. My plucky little boat had looked after me well, but during the height of the storm, I found myself in the dangerous position of trying to round the infamous Cape Finisterre in the dark, close to the shipping lanes in over 50 knots of wind, sailing into the wind and waves. 
Of course, I was now asking way more than could be reasonably expected of such a small boat. In fact, conditions became so wild that even with just a storm jib and tiny storm trysail, the boat could barely manage any meaningful forward headway in the prevailing conditions. We were being constantly slammed by huge waves which swept over the deck, coming out of the darkness like unstoppable freight trains, laying my boat over on its side like a capsized dinghy on a lake. That last night in Biscay was a true test of resilience and personal de determination. It took everything I had to get the boat through the conditions before we could finally resume racing again. I'd been in survival mode for three days. Others weren't so lucky and I write about this account in full in my book High Seas High Stakes. So let me just set the scene it's the first night of the Mini Transat. You're alone in the Bay of Biscay. Daylight has given way to an intimidating pitch black blanket of sky. The winds are increasing, conditions deteriorating. What's it really like to compete in the international Mini Transat race?
46 degrees, 41 minutes, decimal 96. 0 and 4 degrees, 5 9 minutes, decimal 7 4. It's all happening now, I tell you. Just had the main back down on the deck, sewing in that um, second baton that uh, has been breaking loose. Came downstairs to find the bloody uh, camcorder under two foot of water. So that's stuff. And um, the boat is taking a real pounding. A real pounding. We're just uh, looking at the chart, we're just coming out of the, of the continental shelf, so I'm hoping things are going to settle down a bit. But it's pretty full on at the moment, and uh, the boat is really getting taking quite a pasting. Conditions in the Bay of Biscay have been brutal. I was lucky to get through and round Cap Finisterre relatively unscathed. The storms on the first leg of the race had certainly left an impression, especially on my equipment. During the first night of the race, I'd lost the use of my cooker, which had managed to destroy itself in the cabin, probably due to the violent motion as we jumped over the waves. For the remaining nine days of leg one, I had no hot food or drinks. Annoyingly, my camcorder had also succumbed to the might of the weather. I found it underwater in the cabin, which put pay to any chance of capturing any exciting footage on the first leg of the race. My mainsail had seen the worst of the damage, and together with a blown out spinnaker which had destroyed itself by pushing the boat too hard off the coast of Portugal in the aftermath of the stormy weather, both sails would need significant repairs before we set off on the second leg of the race. Perhaps one of the biggest problems on leg one for me was my generator. The generator is used to replenish the electricity into the batteries and provide power to the automatic pilot, instruments, navigation lights and VHF radio. The generator was also swamped in the cabin during the height of the storm when we had more seawater inside the boat than I'd been comfortable with. The net result being that despite having purchased a brand new generator before the start of the race in an effort to secure reliability, it didn't start and it threatened our race at a critical moment after we'd spent all our time trying to escape from the clutches of the Bay of Biscay. Without the generator, the batteries would go flat in a matter of hours and we would not be able to run the autopilot. Without the autopilot, Effectively, we were out of the race. It's that simple. At sea, the solo sailor needs to be a master of all trades. While it's safe to say that I'm not an engineer or a mechanic, I just had to get that generator back online. There was no other option. It just had to come apart and be repaired. When I finally crossed the first leg finish line at Lanzarote in the Canary Islands, I felt mentally rock solid but relieved to have reached the end of the first stage. Initially, I had no idea how, how I'd done, but I knew I had made it. Interestingly, the affairs in the Bay of Biscay had solidified my confidence in both me and the boat. I felt strong in my mind, but weak in my body. My hands and legs were in a bad way and covered in salt sores. I'd later need a trip to a private hospital to help with my recovery. My body was physically bruised and battered from the ordeal, but I knew there was time to recuperate before the start of the second leg. We had done well, and we were one of the front runners. The 
second leg of the Mini Transat was a total contrast to leg one. The second stage was all about the racing and pushing the boat hard to get maximum performance. After just a few days of sailing, the fleet entered the northeast trade winds and we all reveled in the conditions. The northeast trade winds are the same winds which have blown seafarers across the wide expanse of the Atlantic Ocean from Europe to the Caribbean for centuries. Warm winds blowing off the Sahara Desert provide the perfect conveyor belt for some exciting sailing. This is what I've been waiting for my whole life. Had a bit of a um, windy cloud come through. Not a squall, but a bit of a cloud with a bit of pressure underneath it. The breeze went from about 10 knots up to about 18. We've still got the masthead shoot up. Just uh, broke just before I put the camera on. Um, did about 12 knots. It's really, really tricky in these, these, these sort of conditions with this masthead shoot, you know, because the boat bloody takes off. Get to the point where the pilot can't steer, you've got to get the kite down, shit, what, what do you do? You know, the boat ends up putting something to bloody hell. Here we go, we're off again. Shit. You know what I mean? Seems to have got the pilots uh, on a reasonable heading. It's all over the show at the moment, though. Uh, big problems with the pilots. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. It's got a mind of its own, I tell you. Um, most to the north, uh, the boats to the north of, the, of uh, my track uh, seem to be, uh, according to her, sailing into lighter winds now sub 10 knots uh, and boats south of 22 north which is what we are we're on about 20 20 north um, we can expect breeze today all day today of between uh, 15 and 20 knots we've probably got at the moment about 18 knots uh, and we're making a nice course um, uh, pretty much um, down into, into the Guadeloupe region uh, although we're still 2,000 miles away but it's a good track um, reasonably happy with what's going on at the moment, although I uh, would like to see some more, I'd um, uh, like to cl close up on these other boats that are further north. Some boats, looking at the chart, seem like they're a long way away, a uh, long, long way further north. It's going to be very interesting to see uh, how things pan out in the next sort of five or six days. Um, I'm hoping we can um, pull back some time and um, basically get, you know, get into the lead again. Um, Please be happy with what, everything else. We seem to have a leak somewhere. I'm not quite sure where. There's no big deal at the moment. Generator's running well. And um, I suppose I'm not getting as much sleep as I'd like, but I'm getting a reasonable amount. Um, so I'm um, starting to enjoy it. found out where the leak is down by the mast and it ain't look good. Uh, where this water type bulk is, bulkhead is down here, there's a minute, very tiny little crack where it's sealed to the hull and um, it's bloody seeping in water. So there must be a, a hole in the hull somewhere for water to get in. I don't know. I don't know what to think about it. We're 2,000 miles away from the Caribbean and the bloody boat's leaking. <laughs> well, very interesting. Um, it's really only a tiny weep at the moment, but I'm going to have to keep my eye on it, you know?
recharging the batteries now. It's uh, quarter past seven on Friday. Uh, I think it's Friday the 29th. Um, just changed down from the masthead shoot to, um, to the fractional shoot, just because for the pilot really. Um, makes life a bit easier for the, for the pilot to steer and means that I can get some sleep and I can do some navigation and uh, charge up the batteries uh, with the generator in confidence and stuff like that really. Um, if the breeze holds out this sort of pace we'll probably keep this shoot up all night. I'll get some, hopefully get some good sleep and uh, then um, game for tomorrow. Just with a big shoot up the uh, the pilot can't can't cope and you get every couple of minutes you get a bit of uh, pressure come through that lays the boat over on its side and you know I mean, it's it's not good for the boat you, it's not good for the sails and you're going to break something eventually you know so um, I think you've got to take the the step of um, ease back get some kit do the necessary jobs get the shoot up and press full speed ahead when you can and. Uh, and just ease back slightly, uh, you know, when you've got, a, you've got things to do. Pretty happy with what's going on at the moment, and uh, just sort of uh, looking into the end of uh, day eight. Day nine, and once again, Classic trade wind surfing conditions. Um, things going well uh, today so far. We've taken a lot of miles out of uh, the fleet last night. And um, we're only uh, seven miles behind Josephine now. And two miles behind uh, Andorra, France. And uh, we're only um, 30 odd miles behind Navman. So uh, the game is most definitely afoot. Great sailing when it's like this. Spinner for our mains or throw bins. Here we go. Earlier on we had a, a score come through which was great. Put a reef in the main, 14 knots of boat speed. Here we go, bring it on. Excellent fun, really good. Just looking forward to getting into the Caribbean now though and uh, finishing this race. And uh, hopefully in a top five position. I think we can do it. I think uh, Things are going well, there's no reason why we can't. Just got to make sure and hope we don't break anything. And of course, hope that we go the right way. Managed to fix the uh, problems with the boom as well. Managed to use all the uh, 
the new uh, Vectran uh, lashing, 2.5 millimetre lashing that we've used um, uh, or that we've developed uh, with English braids. And it's done a great job. It's lashed up the boom right in the, in the place where I wanted it. And um, without looking closely, you, you wouldn't think there's a problem there now. So it's all it's all done and dusted. Dessert, I suppose. 
the guy who was talking talking way too fast and even even with the recorder afterwards uh, I couldn't understand what he was saying. So um, but we're still in time, which is good. And um, looking forward to uh, arriving in Guadeloupe around about something. Here we go. About 11 o'clock in the evening on uh, Tuesday, the uh, 2nd of November. Got a lot of squalls coming through every few minutes. The boat speed sits at between 8 knots and, and 11 or 12. We just had a surge up to about 12 and a half knots. And that was pretty awesome. Woo! Here we go! Boat speed, 11 knots. We are horsing. Absolutely horsing. English braids, English braids, heading out to sea. English braids, English braids, surfing rather quickly. <laughs> come on, come on, bring it on! A thousand miles to go, bring it on! Got a wet arse now. <laughs> it's great how this boat trims bow up because of the asymmetric spinnaker and the uh, the length of the bowsprit. Great, the, the the combination of the two um, creates a lot of uh, upwards lift to the bow. So. Uh, what it basically means is you can push the boat quite hard downwind in, in big breeze with, um, with big waves because it lifts the bow. And there's always the tendency, here we go, bring it on! Woohoo! And there's no tendency for it to nose dive unless you're really, really, really pushing it. And there's a lot of flare on the bow as well, so uh, big radius on the bow, on the stem. So that all helps to give it a bit of buoyancy up, up forward, stop the nose from diving in. could do with uh, just one reef in, but uh, we've got good boat speed and there's minimal pressure on the boat given the conditions, so why push it, you know? We've got 550 to go to the waypoint, and uh, although I want to go fast, I don't want to go too fast and break something, and then, or drop the rig or something, and then put myself out of the race, so uh, we're, uh, we're so near to the finish, yet so far, and uh, I just want to keep the pace on enough so that we uh, maintain our lead on the boats behind uh, and, and hopefully uh, gain on the boats in front, but if not, certainly uh, hold our own 
um, and see how we go. Most of the race has been uh, on a, on a um, strategy of attack, and now in the closing stages of this of this race, I'm starting to adopt a more um, more of an attitude of um, defence. And what that basically means in English is uh, keep both safe and uh, try and consolidate on our position. The last thing we want to do is blow out a kite or rip the stick out the boat, break the boom, something like that. We had a major wipeout about two hours ago when we had full main and, and this kite on. And we just took off down the face of the wave and just spun out out of control and really laid it over with the main over the fire. Not, uh, not with a kite done anyway. And the boat didn't have grown under the strain and I had to chuck two reefs in the main before she'd come back upright. And she couldn't I couldn't bear away and the kite was flogging to bits and I thought here we go, this is it, this could be all over in terms of the race. But uh, luckily we pulled through that one, just took quite another day and uh, two reefs went in and we slowed up a bit but in real terms we're still going fast. Well, I don't know if we can see this, but over there is quite a loop. The time is um, about 0635 UTC, so uh, I can't actually see it through the camera, but every now and again you get a glimpse of... Uh, Oh, you see the flashing light there, right in the middle of the screen. That's flashing um, two every ten, which is uh, one of the off-lying islands. There it is. Fantastic. We've almost made it. Another 55 miles to go. And when those lines are on, tied up to the dock, we've made it. It's day uh, 16, early hours of day 16. And... Um, about 30 miles from the finish. Got the mast dead shoot up, hardy frock. Making about uh, six knots towards the headland uh, just before we round the, uh, the headland to get into Riviera Sens. So uh, things are going well at the moment. Just had another spinnaker wrap around the four stage just before I put the, uh, the film on and I had to sort that out. But apart from that, things are okay. Uh, and looking forward to uh, getting in within about four or five hours. A bit uh, overcast over there, actually. Ah. You can see Mary Galanti over there. There's a lot of cloud cover at the moment. I'm quite surprised we didn't actually get rained on last night as well. Crossing the finish line of such a life-changing event was a monumentous occasion. My father had flown out from the UK to be there when I arrived. I was pleased he was there to see his son appear on the horizon after what had been such an epic race of endurance. I had done it. I had crossed the Atlantic solo. 
and I'd achieved the best British result in the history of the race. I have such fond memories of the Mini Transat. It's without doubt a very special event, a life-changing experience. For most who compete, it's a one-off experience. For me, I actually often think about having another crack at it. What I like most about the Mini Transat is its simplicity. One person, one small boat and one very big ocean. The boats are fast and challenging, the fleet is big and competitive and the race course and distances involved make it an epic challenge. I hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast and I look forward to sharing more of my experiences out there on the ocean. If you want to know more and keep up to date with my latest news and podcasts, go to my website, alexbennett.co.uk and click on the subscribe button. On the website, you can also get a copy of my ebook, High Seas, High Stakes. The book details the highs and lows of my life as a professional sailor, competing in major ocean races, including two mid-Atlantic rescues, and how I managed to win the biggest double-handed ocean race in the world, only to sink on the way back to the UK. For some great video footage of my sailing adventures, search YouTube, Bennett Ocean Racing. Thanks for listening and see you next time.